Hi, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Great. Um, welcome back for the second day. Um, hopefully everyone had an exciting day at the conference and also an opportunity to explore um, the space, either going back downtown or staying on the beach. I heard people did both. Um, but we're excited for the next day. So I um, wanted to introduce our first keynote, Toby Langel, um, world-leading expert in open source and standardization. So he's the principal and founder of Unlock Open, and he's been a part of and contributed to many different open ecosystems. And I think one of the things that's really important for us to learn from him today is how we can take advantage of the opportunity with the formation of T-Curl to move from the sort of open governance world to real community ownership of the platform and stewardship and how we can sort of evolve together. So excited to hear uh, from him on that subject. So please welcome him. Thank you. Oh. Oh, well, that's an interesting looking slide. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what happened here. Uh, so, um, I'm very excited to be here uh, with you all today. And this sort of start started with um, Ed um, uh, calling me up uh, around February and saying, uh, would you like to come to Lisbon? And they said, yeah, that sounds absolutely great. And then he said to give a keynote. So here we are. Um, and you know, the, 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 the fact that um, I'm here on stage sort of like lecturing you about um, how to build uh, your own community that I'm a complete newcomer to, um, I'm, like the irony of that is a lot, not lost on me, right? Um, and so, um, um, oh, wait. Okay. So there are weird things going on with the slides. Um, yeah, so the, the irony of that is not lost on me, and I'm really looking forward to have a, a conversation in the Q&A today, um, but most importantly, a conversation tomorrow. There's a workshop session at half past 3 p.m., if I'm not um, wrong, um, where we'll really be sort of like actually doing the, the work and having a real discussion about these issues. Um, but first, what I think that what you all ought to do today is celebrate like the fact that you arrived from uh, you know, a, a vendor-driven uh, open source project to this new huge opportunity. Um, I think this is really important. And like I've been on the sort of the back end of um, those transitions. Um, and I know how, like, how difficult and time consuming and stressful that kind of work is. And I think that the folks that have been enabling this deserve like a huge round of applause. So I know that Ed uh, was like uh, key in making this happen, and I'm sure that you, there was lots of other people that were involved. Uh, so please, like, this is a really important milestone. Give him like a clap. Um, but I want you to pay attention to that finish line a little bit and realize that it is actually not a finish line. It's a starting line, right? Like the real work of that transition, um, how this is going to impact the community, really starts like, you know, now that the, the paperwork has, is enabling this. Um, and so, you know, I want to start with a bit of theory to explain sort of why open governance is important and why it's not sufficient. Um, and so, I'm going to talk briefly about the importance of collective ownership for a project. Um, I'm going to talk about why this matters concretely with an example that I'm sure uh, is both dear to you and that most of you are familiar with. Um, and sort of what part open governance actually plays in that and uh, whether that's uh, sufficient or not. Um, Uh, so, you know, the, the first question is, what really is open source? And if you ask open source practitioners what it is, everyone has a different answer, obviously, and so I have mine, and because I am on stage, I will tell you what mine is and try to, you know, try to convince you that it's the right way to think about it. Um, so the way people tend to think about open source, so I'm a consultant, so I do, uh, you know, full quadrant graphs. That's kind of what consultants do. Um, and the way, um, the way people... Uh, think about open source 
uh, tends to fall in broadly two different categories, whether they're more on the legal lawyer side or whether they're more on uh, the actual doing the work side. Um, and, oh, sorry. Um, and, um, you know, on the legal side, people care about the license. So there's an organization called uh, the Open Source Initiative that sort of like certifies that a license is open source or not. And that's kind of like technically what open source means to a bunch of people, in general, more to like the legal profession. Um, and then there is, uh, oh God, there is the question of whether you're actually operating as uh, what the open source community has um, ended up sort of like recognizing as norms, like you know the practices, how you work together, how you contribute to the same uh, 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 source um, uh, code base, etc. Right, um, and um, you can sort of like walk in the combination of the, those four quadrants to see like a very different projects emerge from those, and they have interesting characteristics. So. Um, on the top left quadrant, essentially, you know, projects that have an open source license, um, but that are uh, not really sort of uh, open and community driven. Um, uh, some folks have started calling them nominally open source, and they're essentially sort of like open source in the letter only. Um, if you move down, you will get essentially, uh, th there's a lot of, um, oh, sorry. There's uh, uh, this new term that was being coined from the French of uh, faux, uh, which means uh, incorrect, right? And it goes faux open source, right? Which is uh, open projects, uh, open projects, right? They have a license that kind of looks like an open source license, but it is not really. Um, and you know, we'll give examples about this, and, uh, and I'm sure you'll recognize a bunch of uh, projects that go in that space. Um, and on the top quadrant, you have, you know, real or, uh, or, uh, open source licenses and community driven. And those are really sort of like the, 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 what people think when they talk about open source, like thriving uh, community driven open source projects are on that uh, part, right? And lastly, there's a sort of like an interesting uh, quadrant down there, which is the broader ecosystem, right? Um, and this includes um, uh, things like uh, public domain, um, a lot of the Creative Commons stuff is in there because they're not technically open source licenses, but they have sort of like the same feel. I mean, Wikipedia could be down there, right? Um, and, you know, if, if you look at the different... Oh, I'm really struggling with this thing. Oh, there you go. So... Oh, wait, I'm sorry. There. Uh, um, so, um, you know, uh, originally... Um, you were sort of up here, right? And um, this new governance model allows you to be shifting onto that side. Right, so it's that shift. Um, and you know, the question is, well, why is this shift so important? Um, and, and I think you've all, uh, um, uh, I mean, you all know why community is important from sort of a community perspective, like being together, working on something together. Like, there are a huge amount of benefits, right? But there are also, like, really important business benefits to this that are often forgotten. And uh, there is a really good example of this uh, here was Elasticsearch, right? Uh, I mean, as you're all aware, uh, there was um, some changes in the licensing. Um, uh, originally, Elasticsearch was like a real open source project. And then essentially, they decided that they would no longer be a real open source project. Uh, and that left a whole bunch of communities in a really difficult position. Right? Um, and this wouldn't really have happened um, if the project had had a really strong community of contributors and was community owned. Um, and, you know, to this concern of what happens when, like, the rug is pulled under you, um, there is always the answer of, well, you can fork, right? I can fork. I'm fine. This is open source. It's, it's, I can, there's always that option. And, and the reality of this option is that, in practice, uh, uh, you know, you, you really have successful forks. If you think about it, um, and we were having a conversation yesterday about this, um, the, um, you either have to be like a very large and very powerful company to be able to fork a project and maintain it, 
or you have tightly knit com uh, communities, right? So an example of a very large community, uh, a company, sorry, forking a project, uh, think about uh, the Chrome project, for example, uh, which was originally WebKit. Um, uh, Google was able to fork it and, and build its own browser on top of it because it is a huge company and this was really important to their business. Um, and so they were able to put a lot of resources into it. Similarly, a tightly knit community that was able to fork a project su successfully, the Node.js community, when there was a whole uh, lot of issues with the trademark and Joyent not being like a good steward of the community from the perspective of some community members. The community just went away, built uh, io.js, uh, and because the, the whole community shifted, well, that project won, right? So it's really the, 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 the center of power when you have a strongly knit community is the community, and that's the only time where it is, and that is what really protects your um, business um, important uh, investment when you're um, a uh, building a business on top of an open source project. Um, and so, you know, the question is then: Well, is open governance enough for this? And the answer is: It is a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition. Uh, uh, for uh, um, uh, community-driven open source, right? You can't really have it without, but by itself it is not going to solve all of the problems. It's sort of like the necessary paperwork, much like uh, licenses. Um, and so, you know, this is sort of like my sh short definition of what a community-driven open source is, um, and it really is about building together. Um, it is about all of that building happening in the open, and it is about everyone operating on an equal footing. Like there are no sort of like special conditions for special um, people in the community. Um, so in summary, um, for that first part, I think my timing is actually not that bad. Um, Community-driven open source is a combination of an open source license, an open governance, and norms and practices that enable open collaboration on a level playing field. Like this last bit is really important, and this is the work that is sort of like carved for you all to figure out um, and do. And it's both like a, a bit scary, like there's a lot, right? But it's also extremely exciting. And this is really what can really help sort of uh, um, double down on what's been done so far. And why does this matter? Well, it matters because community-driven projects are just like seriously just better. They're more fun. Uh, there's a lot more things happening. They're more thriving. Um, and you get the kind of um, in-presence um, um, feeling also when you're working remotely on the code base itself. And that is just, I mean, I this is what I why I do this, right? This is what I care about. Um, uh, secondly, it's much more resilient, and as a result, it's a much safer bet. It's safer to adopt a solution that has a thriving community, right? It's important because of the forking issues that we talked about earlier, right? And lastly, I mean, that's one of the many benefits of open source, but having all of these diverse voices that actually have a say um, uh, helps you build much better software that's usable across a broader set of communities. I mean, I was having a conversation yesterday about, for example, payment gateways in South uh, America, right? I mean, that's just an example of something that if the, uh, the organization sort of driving the project is based in North America, well, maybe they, you know, they don't know about this. They haven't thought about it, right? So um, overall, it, it really helps uh, create better software. Okay, so we're done with the theory part now. Um, what I'd like to talk about in the next 15 minutes before like, uh, having uh, a discussion about this is the impact of this exit to community. Uh, this is a term uh, that a, a friend coined, which I really like, and I think it's kind of relevant here, right? because this is what's happening now. Um, and I want to look at two things. First, the concrete changes it's going to create for the project. And secondly, sort of like outline, like give you essentially assignments, uh, <laughs> outline the work ahead um, for um, the sort of like the different key constituencies that we have today. Um, and I'll talk about that when we get to it. So um, I think the first thing that is really important to notice, and I've noticed that in like every project I've been involved with, is there's a huge tendency when a vendor is driving a project to have a vendor, uh, a client vendor relationship. Right? And what does that mean? It means that when you're uh, building on top of uh, that um, software 
um, you, uh, as, a, as a third party, essentially, um, you will have a tendency um, by habit to just go ask for features, ask for stuff, right? And that's, being, that's what it was before, right? But this is sort of like no longer what it uh, should be right now. And so, sort of like dealing with that um, uh, sort of like footprint of this previous relationship is kind of hard. Like uh, habits are hard to change. Um, and yeah, so you know, now everyone's on an equal footing, right? Like you, you can no longer just say something like, um, why is this feature not implemented? Well, it's because like no one feels it's necessary, and like if you care about it, well, go build it. You know, so it's kind of a two-way street. Thank you. Um, the second really important aspect is when you move an open source project that was vendor-driven into the open, you're generally just moving the code. But as we all know, software isn't just code, right? There's a whole bunch of things like processes, design, um, user focus groups, uh, data, telemetry, all of that stuff, right? And all of that stuff, um, while well, you sort of have to figure out where is, is it going to stay, uh, who's going to be handling it, is that what's going to be in the open also? How are you going to do this? And if not, how are you going to make disti distinctions between um, uh, product decisions and uh, engineering decisions? Um, and there's lots of different ways of handling this. In general, what tends to happen is there's a real split. Essentially, if you look at really successful open source projects, they tend to be infrastructure um, projects because that's easy, it's easier to make that split, right? So you have sort of like, um, uh, uh, the, the, the really like the infrastructure bit, and then people use that, uh, organizations use that to build products on top of it. Projects, open source projects that tend to be more of a mix between um, product and projects are, tend to be, um, you know, they're, they're more user focused. Um, think about like um, OpenOffice or uh, Matamo Matamos, the, the Slack clone. Um, and it tends to be a lot more difficult to get um, um, uh, the, 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 the other people to contribute to these projects, right? Because precisely of that problem of who is driving uh, the product and the design decisions. So what's really interesting in this case is that you, you know, I've, I've noticed yesterday that there's a real, um, there's real thinking going on about this in a way that I've never, or like, I don't think I've ever seen done before. Which is, hey, what about if we had a product management uh, product manager in in the organization? This is completely uncommon, right? Usually, um, open source sort of like foundations tend to do marketing, um, and they tend to organize events, and that's kind of all what they do, right? And hold the trademarks. So this is really different because um, also because like you have a lot of money, which is very uncommon in open source. No, but seriously, I mean it makes a huge difference, um, and so. All of this, you know, makes for a really interesting sort of um, 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 situation where you can kind of invent new solutions here. You can actually like uh, innovate, which I think is extremely exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, lastly, sort of like uh, falling off of this, um, the relationship with end users, um, regardless of how you call them, I mean, I also heard like end users being a term that was discussed yesterday is who is the end user that you're talking about here, right? But the relationship with the sort of like the learners and the teachers, um, they tend to belong to uh, the organizations that are actually uh, deploying and building um, uh, solutions on top of it, not to open source projects. What happens if you're starting to move sort of like some of the product decisions in the open source space, whether it's at TKRL or somewhere else. Well, you will have to think about what that implies in terms of having these conversations with um, end users, getting the data of how end users are using this data, right? Uh, 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 using the, the, the software. And, and um, making this, uh, figuring out how to get that data in the open, if that's uh, the plan ahead. 
and, and uh, figuring out how to inform the development of the open source part of the project using that data. All of this is extremely straightforward when it's in-house uh, in, an, in an open, um, even if it, the project is open source, but in a vendor-driven project, and becomes like huge questions. Um, and in W3C, for example, um, uh, this comes up all the time. Uh, large vendors come in, in meetings and they say, well, we've done user studies that shows that the specification should be written that way and do this and that. And people in the room are like, well, show us the user studies. And then the vendor says, well, I can't because of privacy reasons of how we collected that data. And you know, you have a stalemate, like the, the conversation can't continue. People have to suddenly trust that the vendor is actually um, correct about that, that the study was properly done. Um, and all of these things um, uh, are hard problems to solve. So, yeah, as I said, I think this is like a huge opportunity for T-Curl to uh, really innovate and, and do something. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I know some, I know some, some people are, are feeling I'm putting a lot of weight on their shoulders, uh, and, and I am <laughs> to some degree. But, you know, I mean, you don't get that kind of opportunities like very often, so sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, assignments. Uh, essentially, I sort of like split this community in, in three for now. Um, there is sort of the folks that were the vendor of the project. Um, there is the broader community. If you don't like those terms, I'm sorry. Um, uh, they're placeholders to have this conversation. And then there is the organization. Um, so what to you edX will have to accept is that as part of transitioning the project to a more uh, community-driven and open model, there is a trade-off that is absolutely going to happen. It's going to slow things down a bit. It doesn't have to be a huge slowdown, right? But it is going to put a bit more process in a number of different things. And the best way for you all to deal with that on the 2U edX side is for you to really spell out what you're going to get out of doing that. And I think that is super important. Um, a lot of open source is uh, driven by um, you know, engineers and, and people being, being in the community that just are really keen on working together because just like this is great. Like we all love doing this. Um, but you know, if there's no business value attached to this, works a, you know works a couple of months and then like the reality of why would we do it this way if we can do it like faster this other way comes uh, banging on the door, right? So it's super important to spell out the business value. Um, and then lastly, sort of like on a on day-to-day -day basis, um, there's like two key things. When the broader community comes knocks, knocking on the door asking for stuff, help them learn how to make those things, right? Um, don't, I mean, even if it's a little, it takes a little more time, right? This is, uh, I know it's difficult, but it's important because you will, you know, it's the, the fish and uh, like learn, give them a, a person a fish and or teach them how to fish uh, sort of um, attention. Right? And the, the second part, which is also just as important is uh, when there's a, a large vendor involved in a project, and I mean, we've all been there, right? Like the, the person working on the thing is literally on the desk behind you. I mean, less for the last two years, I, I agree, right? But like, you know, that's gonna be the case again. And um, when that is the case, the temptation to actually just solve that problem there is huge, but then you create a culture of this, people outside of the, of, of the, the, the largest contributor uh, feel that they don't know what's going on, they don't have enough information, and they disengage, and then like everything falls down, right? So there's a lot of effort that you will have to make to make this happen. But you're not the only one that will have to do work, right? Um, the broader community has to understand this shift that I was talking about in terms of the relationship with the, uh, the largest original vendor. Um, I like to talk about open source projects as being duocracies, right? 
And uh, duocracy, uh, very simply, is what happens when there's like eight people around a campsite and someone's like, oh, I'm hungry, I'm going to go get food. And they go get food and then bring back food and they share food with the community. And uh, folks um, are really happy about this. And then uh, time goes on and um, they, um, you know, it's always the same person going to buy food and some of the people start questioning his or her, their taste in whatever it is that they're buying, right? And, uh, you know, it's like, why do we eat pizza all the time? Well, it so happens that there's one person that is providing pizza for free for the community, right? So if you want a different meal, it's not like, it's not a decision maker here, right? They're just doing the work. If you want a different meal, like, go talk to them. I don't know, figure it out. Like, go buy something else yourself and bring it over. So that's what duocracies are, right? Essentially, like, if you want things to go to sway one way, like, you literally have to put in the work, put in the engineers, do it. And so, again, you have to spell out why this matters to you from a, a business perspective. Because if you don't, then you cannot make the business case for actually spending in, uh, engineering resources or whatever resources there is on the project. So that's super critical. Um, and yes, I mean, the, the other side of the coin of uh, um, the original vendor uh, uh, not giving away fishes is like, please don't go ask for fishes. Right? Like, be polite about this. <laughs> like, make, it, make their lives easier, too. Um, and lastly, uh, T-Krill, right? Oh, my God, like, so much to do. Seriously. <laughs> um, so, yes, did I mention that we're going to talk more about this on Friday? Like, please come and join us. I, I, this conversation, I think, is going to be really exciting. Um, I think it's a massive opportunity, and I think, yeah, you're really well set up for this. Right? You have great talent. Seriously, like, I've, I've, I'm very amazed about what I've seen so far. Like, you're full of great people, super excited about this, very knowledgeable. I, I'm, I'm very excited. Um, you have ambition um, because you're actually thinking about this, not just like, hey, let's mimic how other projects have been doing this, but um, let's figure this out. Like, we're different. Um, let's figure out how we can do this. Um, and, oh, my God, you also have money, and that is really important, right? No, seriously, I mean, like, open source is a lot more about business and money than people actually are uh, happy to mention on a regular basis. And I think it's important, and that makes a huge difference because you can actually have a long-term vision on this and try things out and put in resources to try this and make it happen. Um, and that's all I have for you, and I think we're on time for a few questions. Wonderful. This is perfect. Uh, so, uh, I, yeah, discussion more than questions would be great. And if not, uh, uh, we can, again, have more of that uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much. I was warned. By you. <laughs> Hello? Okay. I told you I would have questions and comments. Yes. This was fantastic. Thank you so much, and I agree so much with so much that you said. I'm going to quibble with a word, and I want to know your thoughts on this. Fair. So you said that T. Krill orchestrates the community. Oh, God, yes. Where I have used the word facilitate, and I think there's a bit of a difference there in terms of conductor standing at the front of the orchestra versus you know somebody who's introducing somebody to to uh, the second chair violin um i think i'm going to tell you the real story okay that sounds great <laughs> um i learned a lot about this community yesterday this like i really was you know this is my first time meeting all of you most of you i had a few calls before um and so i rewrote my talk yesterday and around 1 a.m., I was like uh, working on that slide. Now, it's, it's actually funny because it's that very word. And I'm like, what can I call this? Like, <laughs> I don't know how to call this. And yes, you're absolutely right. Facilitation is a much better term. Thank you. Oh. Um, so you. you you, you mentioned that um, the community will have to learn how to um, do things themselves. Actually, the, the community has been doing some of that for some time. 
Uh, but one of the recurring problems uh, is often that people have been doing it on their corner to try to get an advantage as a vendor. You're the one who does that or who decides that. And we have regularly ended up with solutions that are developed and redeveloped by multiple people in analytics, in DevOps, and etc. So what advice would you have for that? This is a very good question. Um, and I think this is a question where, oh my god, this is such a good question. Uh, there's, um, like, I've, I've been hoping for a very long time that um, um, there would be some kind of marketplace-like solution. This is a really bad term for this. Um, some, some sort of place where um, especially governments and nonprofits can come together to figure out how to work, how to get an open source solution built for them or, or, or contribute to the same open source solution, right? Um, and I feel like you have the opportunity here because of how your community is structured and the fact that there's a lot of uh, involvement from folks that are not necessarily only business-driven, uh, um, for these folks to um, be helped to sort of flock on uh, solving one problem and even potentially have um, the four profit and the, the, the developer and uh, agencies that are involved in the community sort of like um, come and help build a thing, right? So it, I feel like there's this really interesting, I don't know if I'm explaining this well, but essentially uh, nonprofits, uh, governments, education, uh, healthcare, they all need the same kind of tools for, to solve these same kind of problems as you mentioned, right? Um, and there is no real place uh, for them to sort of get together and say, hey, we all need the same thing. Can we figure out how to build it together in a way that is uh, maintained long term and also uh, cheaper to do and gets us a better product, right? So this could be a role that t -Krill could have to sort of figure out how to uh, um, make this happen, facilitate uh, this uh, 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 sort of like marketplace of um, exchange. Um, uh, for this particular project at the scale of uh, open edX rather than like a bigger thing. Hi, and uh, thanks for a uh, br brilliant talk. Oh, thank you. Like, I, I like this question already. This is <laughs> <laughs> Wait and see. Oh, well, <laughs> damn. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm actually quite concerned b because of uh, your great uh, analysis, uh, uh, because I feel like the Ambiguity uh, goes uh, larger in, 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 in the terms that uh, you've shared. And I want to ask you, what do you think are like the two or three major risks that uh, are in, in this uh, change and, and how would you recommend to mitigate it? This is a really good question. Uh, are you there tomorrow? So I actually have to answer the question now. <laughs> um, it's really hard to say because I don't know enough about um, the community, frankly, and I don't know enough about the different, what the different players in the community want to do. Um, the risk in general um, um, in circumstances like this one um, is essentially sort of like the opposite of what I was advising people to do, right? Which is kind of a bunch of things actually change on paper, but behaviors um, uh, and relationships don't. And things just stay the same, except it's called differently, right? And so you don't get any of the benefits. And when at some point things change and the project is maybe not important, as important as it was to like a, the, key, the key vendor, um, then the community isn't ready to continue sustaining it at a reasonable cost going forward. So like for me, that's the biggest risk. 
it's if you just pretend that um, uh, if you don't do the work, uh, you essentially, you know, it's, it's back to, oh, okay, this, this was the last question. <laughs> if you don't do the work, um, you end up back at the forking risk, which is, well, if there's no really strong community of contributors, if you don't have like lots of, uh, in, uh, well, lots, I mean, three or four a heavily invested organization in supporting the project for whom it makes business sense, then the risk is when it no longer makes business sense for the key vendor to continue supporting it, that the community struggles. Um, and as a result, uh, you know, lots of pain for everyone involved. That's the biggest risk. I, can I take one last question to end up on a like, uh, less stressful note? Do you mind? Okay, good. So one last nice question. Is that a nice question? No, it's not. Uh, come tomorrow. <laughs> so can you come tomorrow? Seriously? Yes. Let's have it tomorrow. A nice question, please. <laughs> oh, oh, so let's have the nice question. Yeah. Let me try. Now I have a, a too much responsibility about the question. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, are you able to share really practical uh, ideas about um, how this community can grow? Because uh, we have the risk, uh, we have the structure, we have, uh, so to say, the stakeholder in place, we have a lot of stuff, but really, really practical things that we can maybe change uh, behind what we made in the past as a community and have a new perspective. That's a question. I don't know if it's nice. That's uh, a good question. Nice. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have, I, frankly, I don't have a good answer for this because it's a really hard problem. And that's part of, like, growing a community is hard. Um, for me, like, it's, it's usually, I mean, it's always the same thing. Like, if the, the business value of contributing to the community and being involved with it, in it is clearly articulated and is actually valuable, um, then it is very easy to have people uh, get involved. If it's not the case, then it is very difficult, right? So, I mean, it's kind of like when you, it's kind of when you want to sell something, right? If you're selling like a really nice object, uh, like people are going to come and buy it, and if people don't understand what the object is for, they will not be willing to spend a lot of time uh, or a lot of resources on it. And so, making, the, articulating the value and not only the value of open edX, but the value of being involved in the community. Um, demonstrating how, um, when you're involved, you can actually shape the project. And all of the benefits that of open source and of contributing to open source, like the easier you make that un uh, understandable by the different members of the community, um, the more the community is going to be, uh, to grow and, and be solid. And with this, I yield the floor. Um, thank you so much. Sorry. Awesome. Thank you, Toby. Um, next up, we have um, Paula Marquez, who has an extensive background in business transformation and is the executive director for business and executive education here at Nova. Um, also the author of the book, The Ages of Superhumans, Paula has uh, a lot to say about how organizations and leaders can thrive in our increasingly volatile, uncertain, um, complex, and ambiguous world. So figuring out how we can succeed in that world is gonna be critical for us as a community, and so we're excited to talk about that with Paula. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the introduction. And it's so great to have this community here at uh, our home, finally, after two years of waiting. And what I'm going to talk to you about is this brand new game that we all have to play. And it's a very scary game and a very exciting one. So I need to be with my slide here, please. 
if you may change it. Oh, sorry. It was me. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Toby. So, um, the, the main topic that we are going to address in our talk, it's this changing the game's rules. It's not just the rules that are changing, it's actually the whole game that is changing. The game for the world, the game for business, the game for us educators. So it will, it will be more or less the new game that will, be, uh, that will help us to answer all the questions that till now they are un un unanswered. It's a very tough one. I'm going to tell you, because it's new, we don't know how to play it. We are used to the old game, and we love the old game. It's the only one we know, and we're pretty damn good on it. And now we have to play another one. And I'm going to tell you why this is, going, this is happening. So my, my three minutes of talk before the questions, your questions and your comments, will have two different parts. The first one, I want us to understand what is happening. What the hell is happening? Why we're changing games? Why someone decided to change the game? Because it's a tough game. So we should be very, very clear about what's happening. And normally, we in business schools, we don't stop to think about raising your levels of consciousness about what the hell is going on. So I want to spend my first minutes to give you an insight of what we are doing in the world that is making the game changing. We are the change makers. So Let's not say, oh, I don't want to play the game. I'm the one who's saying, let's play the new game. And then I'm going to give you some insights of how can we just accelerate the game? How can we win the game? Because we are winning machines. If there's a new game with new rules, I want to know what are those rules because I want to win it and you too. So this is the, the two parts. And the first part, it's, okay, let's, let's understand what is the game that we are all um, uh, gaming that we are playing these days? Well, it's the game of scalable efficiency. And I'm going to tell that with these my green t-shirts. So it's the game that, who wins the game, the winner of this game is the one that does it, does it faster and cheaper. You want green t-shirts? I'm the winner because I can do it faster and cheaper than my competitor. That gives me a competitive advantage, so I win it all. But that is a problem that is based on what we economists call economies of scale. What does that mean? It means that you have to produce a lot of t-shirts, a lot of, lot of t-shirts, in order to reduce the average cost of the unit of the t-shirt. I know to play that game. I have to be big. I have to buy a lot of raw materials. I have to have a lot of robots to do it. And now I can have a t-shirt for a cent. And I win the game. I win it all. So that's the game we are used to play. Cheaper and faster. And we're pretty damn good on that. But there's a problem with this game. And some colleagues, some engineer colleagues from faculty of engineer, sometimes come to me and say, oh, Paula, this model is not working anymore. We have reached the maximum of efficiency. We can't be more efficient than we are. Are we stupid? What are we doing bad? Not even robots can help us doing cheaper and faster. So we are reaching our limits of the curve. And so the problem with this model it, is that it's based on stable environments that don't change constantly, that don't evolve at a rapid speed. It's a predictable model. I need to predict that you will buy my green t-shirts. So like the Beatles, don't let me down. At the end, you have to buy those, otherwise I'll have a problem. Imagine I have my warehouses full of t-shirts of one cent. All based, all the workers, all the world based on that. So this model works on a more predictable world with more stable things, just a butterfly coming from time to time, not disruption. I don't like that. My factory doesn't like that. My green t-shirts don't support that. And don't come to me and say that you want a blue one, a, a, a George Orwell's one with pink pigs, just to match your pink tattoo part. Don't have it. I can do it, but it will cost you more. You'll have to pay more. 
all my factories made, all my engineers, they're specialized on green t-shirts. I can't ask them one of those, they can't do it. We have no fabrics, we have no inks, we have nothing. I can do it to you, but you'll have to pay. There it will be expensive, I tell you. That is what's happening to our role model. And the, and the great thing is that the model, the old model of scalable efficiency is cracking because now this story of I can do that t-shirt is completely wrong. I can do it because technology allows me to do your, your strange t-shirt at a very reasonable cost. Do you want it pink? Do you want the pink pig? I do it. Do you want the green one? I do it too to match your new tattoo that is green. It's unique, you're the only one that has that color. Why? Because technology allows us to crack the old model. We don't have to be big. We don't have to scale, to be, to, we don't have to be big in order to reduce the, the, the average cost of production of our goods. We can have something that is massive tailoring. It looks like a paradox. Because in the old world, if you want a catwalk model, it will cost you a lot. It's ready-made for you, it's customized, it's personalized, and that costs a lot. But this new world, technology allows us to crack that rule and say, I can have your model at a very reasonable price. So I don't, be, I don't have to be big. I can have this massive tailoring because technology allows me to do that. And that, my friends, it's the rule changing of every business. Because we are not used to being able to do that small t-shirt, that special product that each one of you, do you have it? Do you want it? And my problem is not, I'm used to do the green ones. I know how to change from the green ones to the blue ones. I can do that. Give me a couple of months. But I just can't do this every day. Every time you just enter in my website, I need to choose what type of pictures do you want. But I can do it because I'm not alone. I have technology that will help me. And so the game now, it's completely different. I have to anticipate what type of tattoos are we going to do next in order to see, oh my God, I can see that maybe, maybe you like a yellow one. A pink yellow one, it's not Animals Farm, it's another book of George Orwell, it's 1984, you want the big brother here? I had to anticipate that, the big brother. And that's a different game. It's not a machine-like game. It's a more human brain game. So now that you, I think you understand the big shift that we're living, let's go for the big shift we're saying. So till now, the competitive advantages were given to us by producing faster, producing cheaper goods. That, that, that factory, that business win it all. So the winners, the competitive advantage, were the ones that could scale efficiency. We are pretty damn good on efficiency. We build all our business schools to teach leaders and managers to scale efficiency. We're, we're good on that. Ask us a question. We are all, all our models are built on this. But they're reaching a high. They're reaching a plateau. We are plateauing. This model is cracking. We can't just be more efficient. We are cracking, we're burning out humans and we're cracking machines too because we just can't be more cheaper and more faster than we are. And then th this brand new model is coming and we don't know how to play this game because it's scary, it's the unknown game. I don't know what are you going, what's going on in your head and that you're going to want, what are your needs? Some of your needs, I, do, I can't anticipate, even with, with all the data I have about, about you. Because you and me, we're crazy. We're exotic beings. And this is a brand new game. We have things that are lacking, we have imbalances. That's why business opportunities will always exist. Because they're not perfect, thank God. Otherwise, business will crack, will be perfect. And so skill learning, it's the new model. We have to skill learning now. We have to have um, organizations that are robust enough and resilient enough just to say, now we're going to change all of this, now we're going to enter and venture into the unknown, and we say we don't know. 
what is going to be tomorrow. That's tough because we hate this model. We prefer the other one. We prefer the predictable world, the stable world where you answer my quest and I ask you, do you buy my green t-shirt? And you say, yes, produce hundreds. I like that world. We humans, our brains don't like this new world because it's the unknown world. It's an I don't know world, but it's also the learning zone. That's our business. So you should be in advance with all the business. It gives us also the language in order to calm down executives because they're stressful these days. They're super stressed because they don't know what's going on. The old model is not working. They're using the same tools we, to we told them and we teach them for the last 200 years. They're not working anymore. And they are a little bit stressed. And so why is it important to, to talk about um, the scalable learning world? Because you're talking about resilient tribes, resilient organizations. And resilience, it's like this toy, this super tiger, happy tiger. You know these always standing up toys that we just crack them, we pull them down, and they always return to the same position. Okay, you just pull me down, you can do whatever you wanted with me, I will be back to that position balanced again. That's what resilience is. And guess what? Scaling learning gives us this ability of turning back again to the same position. Learning communities, learning tribes are more resilient than the others. You know, kick me because I will be back with the same position back because I'm completely doped with dopamine because I'm learning. You know, what happens when we are learning? People don't understand that, but when we are curious, curiosity changes the chemistry of our brains. We got a shot at dopamine. We actually are doped, naturally doped. And people say, really, Paula? I like that. And it's legal. Come on, you can come to university and give you a dope, a normal one, dopamine. You don't have to hide from police or something like that. I've, we are in a very legal business of doping people with a good thing, with dopamine. So when you're curious, when you make questions, your shot, your head, your brain gets a shot of dopamine. So you are with a kind of anesthesia. The world is changing. You say, oh, good. I like this. This is changing. Let's surf the wave of changing, of disruption. It's fun. Let's learn with it. And that's what's happened with tribes that are learning. They're not scared about disruption, about constant innovation, about the need of... They're doped because they're learning. Leonardo da Vinci was doped all his life. That's what happened to learners, to polymaths. That's why they just accept and they live throughout their lives because they are doped. Otherwise, no human would um, bear all sorts of change and innovation. And so, the problem is that it's no longer important to be on the same position than we were before. That's not enough. People say, oh, that's not enough, coming to returning to the previous position. No, we have to come better. We have to be anti-fragile, like Nassim Taleb told us. What is anti-fragile is being better. Uh, being better after we take, we hit someone that hits us, the world hits us, a big wave just pull, pulls us down. So anti-fragile are organization, organisms, people that just become better with disorder, better with chaos. That's good, doped, and better with chaos. That's us, that's our business, right? The learning business. So it's a, it's a very actually interesting business for the world because it, it, it creates a more, more robust, more robust organizations, not fragile ones, anti-fragile. You can hit me, I can bear all the disruption you can. It's like, you know, it's like that, do you know that Hydra, Greek mythology, that organ with lot of heads, snakes. If you cut one of these heads, what happens? Two heads come in that. So I tell you, cut my head, please. Come and cut. I'm here, cut my neck. Two heads will appear on that. So I want you to cut my, from time to time, not cut all the heads at the same time. So I won't be able to survive, but some, from time to time, I will ask you to cut my head because I'll be stronger after that. So things that just evolve, just thrive with disorder, with chaos. That's what we need because we are in the middle of a big chaos. What is the problem of this? It's a very tough thing to do, to do this shift. 
to create this shift from learning um, from the uh, learning efficiency or from the scalable efficiency to the scalable learning world. And when we analyze uh, companies, the only study I know it's from July 2008, it's scary. The majority of the organizations, they're not learning tribes, they're not learning organizations, they're not playing this game. This game is very tough to play. What is this game? Is this game, is, is this game where we say, if we're not learning, we're not doing our business. If we're not learning, we're not delivering what we promised to the market. So these organizations, it's a, they're very narrow. They, the, the, the possibility or the probability that we live in a non-learning organization, it's huge. Because only 10% uh, of organizations, and, and Harvard analyzed, I believe, the 700 biggest companies in the United States, and some of them in the world, they're not learning organizations. Nothing to be afraid of. There's a huge opportunity to turn into a learning organization. But how do we do it? Why is this so difficult? It looks like a good game. I told you it's a dopamine game. It's a game that gives you robustness. It will help you thrive in this crazy world of the unknown. So why people are not playing it? It looks like a little bit schizophrenic. Because we are full of things that were, uh, are not allowing us to to evolve on that. And so my second part of my talk with you, it's, it's about the blockers and the boosters of this game. Because we, we all recognize why I call it blockers and boosters, because a blocker can be a booster if you solve it. And if we, if we, they're both. So if you look at them, uh, you can look at that in both ways. So they're not just a blocker, they're simultaneous blockers and boosters. So I, I bring some of them for you to realize and say, oh, that's why. Oh, that's why you only have 10% of uh, companies or organizations, not just uh, private companies, but all organizations where we, the uh, education business, we are included. So, first one, we do a stupid, very stupid thing. We just separate work from learning. And this is an anthropological issue. It's a semiotic issue. It happens that we humans need to have words to understand reality. If we don't have a word to say, oh, this is that, we don't understand that. We're very pretty bad on conceptual thinking and abstract thinking. Don't ask us to do that. We need to have a word. Give me a word, put things on the word, and I, you have my heart, I understand that, and we'll start discussing it. The problem is that when we create words, we, we fill the words with stuff, and we fill these two words with different stuff. And they, for us, they are different things. Work is one thing. Close your eyes and think about work. What is the image that you have? Right, now close your eyes and think about learning. It's not the same thing. And it's tough. So my point is, maybe we, we have to create a new world, a new word to, to say something that is not work, it's not learning, it's both. Don't know what is the word, you're the expert, so let's create it. Because this learning, this scalable learning new world, is not just sharing more knowledge, it's not just increasing the speed of reading or uh, we have to share more and more and more. It's also, we have to create new knowledge more. We have to be able to create new knowledge in our community. It's not just a sharing issue, it's a creating new environment, uh, a new um, knowledge environment business also too. And so we need to transform work in learning, otherwise we can do it. Because where are you going to learn? At midnight? From midnight to two o'clock in the morning? It's not enough. We need to learn throughout our day. We need to change this mindset that we have that work is one thing and learning is another thing. And so, the point for our leaders is that if we're not teaching, you're not working. You're not, if you're not teaching, you're not leading. If you're not teaching, you're not creating these learning communities. And this is a big change for our leaders. Throughout these two years of pandemic, I always heard leaders say, how do I guarantee that my people is producing? Scale level efficiency model. How do I guarantee that these guys at home are producing? No one, but no one, companies that I spoke with, and I did a huge anthropological research th uh, throughout these two years, no one said, how do I guarantee these guys are learning Th the same way that they learn in the office? No, no one cares about learning. Everyone cares about producing the green t-shirts. No one cares about the other part. And so this is the first blocker. We just separate both worlds. And if, when you're still separating both worlds, it's complicated to scale anything and to scale learning. Another thing is that 
what happens to our questions? We're not questioning. So in order to learn, in order to dopamine to happen, the magic has to have a question. We have to be curious about something. We have to make a question. We have to say, I don't know. But we know everything. It apparently, apparently, we know everything. We don't question. We don't question at school. We don't question in companies. One of the reasons I came to academia was I had a lot of questions, and they didn't allow me to question in, in corporate world. But in academia, sometimes we don't question too. We're too arrogant to think that we know it all. And so what happens is that a, a, a British kid, four years, young girl, they, a British young kid does about 390 questions a day to her poor mom. Imagine the sleeping time, it's about one question, 2.5 minutes. A little boy at the same age does a little bit less, which, which compr uh, proves that we women question more, we talk more, but less, not, not, it's not far from, from that. But after this point, imagine what happened is that, I don't know where the questions go. Uh, if you just compare with reading skills or writing skills that they have a kind of a, a plateau and the age of 12 or 13, but even though we are still using them, it apparently we know everything at the age of four, we start asking. And at the age of 18, only 20% of the population um, have used this skill in a regular basis. So these are the scientists, maybe, the guys that don't know things, that go to labs and they try it. So this is super important. We need to rebuild again the question in our, in our um, societies, in our communities. It's, it's good to not knowing. And it's changed the mindset because we were promoted because you knew. You were, you were hired because you knew it all. So we, we feel a little bit shame not knowing. Again, another booster, and that is a big one. We forget that we are slow learners. You know, we're not exponential. People told us about exponential curve. I have a, a colleague from Singularity University that said, I was 10 years of my life trying to explain exponential to people. People don't think exponential. They don't understand what is exponential thinking. And now the virus helped me to do the pitch. Even my grandmother knows what is exponential curve, but it, because it's the curve of, of the virus. So it's, it starts very slow and then skies rocks. And what happened is that we're not like the virus. <laughs> We're not like that. We're linear. And there are some people that say that we are logarithmic. You know, for the guys from mathematics, uh, I, I'm, I'm an optimistic, so I like to think about linear because logarithmic has a plateau in that. So, but there are some researchers that say that we reach our maximum level of ev evolution in terms of our brains because we're subcontracting a lot of new things now. But that question apart, we're lo we are slow learners. And one of the problems that we have on this scaling learning is that we are trapped on this trap that's short-term efficiency. Our leaders, they just can think about 10 years or about the future or about long-term. So investing in learning, it's a very long-term game. The problem is that the, the previous game was a short-term term one, and we want things and we want rewards very shortly. We want quick wins. We love quick wins. But learning, it's a very long-term winner game. And the majority of, of companies, they're not willing to wait uh, for the long term. Even if we have a lot of research that is uh, incompatible between efficiency and learning. A lot of research we've been doing, doing and this is clear. If you are focused on results and on performance, someone that raises the hand without, it's a pain in the ass. It's someone that is always asking and making questions and with curiosity. It slows us. We want to go fast, not to think too much. But you have to have this balance between the short term with efficiency and the long term um, with the, the scalable learning. Otherwise, we will be trapped on that. So research tells us that if we're only focused on results, on efficiency today, my people can deliver today, of course, but maybe they will not deliver tomorrow because they didn't learn. They only have the tools of the past. And so, um, what are the last one? It's we need to master this learning algorithm. We master the machine algorithm so well. If you want to know machine learning, deep learning, reinforcement learning, you go, you find all courses all over. But if you want to know about human learning, good luck. I had to study it, I had to create it myself because I haven't. So our excitement 
is with machines and good because we are knowing more about us to program machines because we're programming them to learn like we learn. So we know a lot. These last 20 years, we know a lot about us because we have these machines in our head. We can observe it and we can look to a, um, a brain, a human brain living. And so we are uh, slow learners, as I, as I told you. And the, the learning curve is a sigmoid. It's an S curve. It's a very tough curve. So at the beginning, we just uh, spend a lot of time and energy, and the proficiency is not very big. So the majority of us, we just um, uh, give up in the beginning of the curve. The learning doesn't take off the majority of the time because it's a very tough curve. We need to know that it's tough. It's not easy to learn anything from swimming to riding a bike to the math algorithm. And then we are attacked by a lot of things like the imposter syndrome. We think, oh, I'm the one that doesn't know NFTs or blockchain. Everyone knows. And we'll discover that I'm the only person in the world that doesn't know nothing about this. And this makes us frustrated. You know, this makes us frustrated. And frustration is one blocker of education and of learning. A lot of uh, companies and a lot of governments, they're trying to tackle the frustration. People need to, f to, to understand how we frustrate better. Without frustration, there's no learning. It's tough. But if we learn how to frustrate ourselves, we'll learn better. Why and how? Laughing at us with humor. Humor is a very rational thing. If you just laugh at us, how stupid we are in that f first phase, we are all, it's not about the culture or something, we are all very bad at the beginning. And so um, there's why there's a huge range of the biology of love, sorry. I'm not very good on this. So there's a lot of, of um, research on the biology of love uh, because it will help us on learning better than learning faster because it will give us a rational thing about our emotional feeling that is bad. The love, it's very emotional. It's, not, it's very rational. It cuts emotional part and feeling bad on the beginning. And it's, uh, uh, it's one part also of my part of my research. It's, it's the anthropology of creativity. The same algorithm that makes us laugh is the same algorithm that makes us create new things because we laugh of stupid things, of things that we are not expected, unexpected things that we mixed. And that's uh, why we laugh also with things that people tell us and we, we found it funny. And we also learn that we <laughs> learn in two different stages. We learn when we are super focused like this boy there, super focused and concentrated. But you also learn when we are doing nothing. Because our brain is not just doing nothing, our brain is organizing all the stuff that he grabbed in the focus phase. So we need to have this in between. Fa phases of pretty much focus and phases with doing nothing. That's why sleeping is so important for, for our brain to learn better. To finish, just a couple of two ideas. We have to, in order to scale learning, it's not just reading more books, reading faster, uh, doing more online courses. It's, it's making a kind of um, mimet mimetizing what's happening in complex ecosystems like biology. So we need, maybe we need to look more about nature to what happens in complex um, uh, ecosystems and not just look at us as machine or mechanical things. And in complex systems, by definition, they cannot, they have complex problems that cannot sol be solved just by a bright head. We have to have a community, an ecosystem of trade, of um, constantly creating knowledge, constantly creating life. And when we observe these ecosystems, we'll find things like diversity are important for, for creating life and things like that. So my advice is, let's focus on biology, on nature. Nature will have some of the answers we have, and at the end, I believe the solution will be this balance between the short-term learning that machines will help us doing, that they're fast and very content-oriented. We're pretty bad on content learning, but they are good. Robots are good on that. Let's them do the job on the short-term learning with, the, with content. And let's do us the long-term context learning. We, need, we are the ones that understand context, that understand what is the type of T-shirt or the type of um, brand new things and tattoos that some human is going to do and that will need something to match with. And so this is my final advice for us. Let's keep this short term and long term and do this Centaurus vision about the world 
and make machines learn faster at the short term and help us give us time to learn um, in, the, in the long term. And thank you for your attention. And so I'm here for your comments, your questions, anything you want to um, agree with me, dis disagree with me, you're free <laughs> to. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's probably one of the most impressive uh, exploration on just the nuance of learning. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, so I wholly agree with you. And my question will probably to ask what your advice might be just around uh, bridging the gap. So this is all well and good in theory and in yes. academia. In business, uh, we need to then manage the constraint between time and money. Yes. So I would like to have that breadth to facilitate yes. natural learning. But then for a business, there's a bottom line, there's EBITDA. How do we reconcile that? Uh, great question, great question. W well, the, the thing is that what we have today, we work with a lot of companies. And uh, it, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not, because we are, we are still learning money with the old model. And uh, our mindset, we train people to think like the old model. It's, and we hate these changes. So what we are saying is that now I have this new exciting game. No one hears us. Because we are earning money now. The problem is some sectors, they are already losing talent. They don't know what to do. They are reaching maximum efficiency. For example, we have several uh, engineer colleagues studying why on earth are we not producing uh, um, more efficiently than in the past. And this is tough because, you know, the majority of the models of scalable efficiency are um, 1980s Toyota-based before digital revolution. You know, all these things that we leverage our world doesn't consider this centaurus world with humans and machines. In order to be more efficient now, you have to come to this new world of scalable efficiency that you are not alone. You have to think you, not you against the machine, not the, uh, humans racing against the machine, but you with the machine. And we are not there yet. So for someone, it's still a kind of a deaf conversation, but for someone, they are knocking at our doors and say, this is not working, help me. And it is easy when it's not helping because they're losing money, they're losing talent. Um, we had uh, uh, last, uh, uh, yesterday, I couldn't be with you because I, we had a lunch meeting with a big corporation in Portugal that's losing you rapidly. And they don't know what to do. They're losing a bunch of talent. They are losing their brand, their reputation. The, ch the business is changing because they're not, um, th the tools are not working anymore. And so what is, uh, what is, complicated here. We are saying, okay, let's face that, let's abandon that world of stability and go venture into the unknown. No one comes with us. And the first project we do, they're so schizophrenic. We are doing a huge big project about the future of work, creating the future of work organizations. And the first meetings, I like schizophrenic meetings because the client says, the uh, company says, okay, but tell us what are you going to look in the future? We don't know. And okay, but when are you going to know? Maybe they, in an year, because you want some scientific base, so we have to have a time to study things, to study trends, to see what that applies to you. But then they laugh and they say, look, we are schizophrenic because we want to learn, adventure the unknown, but already knowing what's going to happen. That doesn't, <laughs> that's not possible. And so um, our point is, let's do it together and the process will be as important as the end game. So you, you will, learn how to be uncomfort with not knowing. We don't know either, but it's very tough because in the old days, we were hired because we knew, <laughs> you know? And now we ask, hire me because I don't know. <laughs> okay, uh, I trust you, but, but, I, I, but we eventually will if we go together and if you just partner with the right people that are the right thing, people that are thinking good and are putting great things on paper and doing tests. It's like scientific method. Testing hypothesis, this work or not in an agile mode, not having 20 years of longitudinal studies that the ones that are academic, you know, it's not enough. We have to be technology driven and also science driven at the same time. So I think it's something that we are learning. It's uh, for the ones that are already, that are still earning money, it's very tough. But they are seeing the other ones uh, saying, oh my God, my, ha my house is on fire. I don't know how to do it. I always did this and this did work. And it's a very fast phase. You know, it's very fast and they don't know how to do it. 
And that's when I think it's the first thing to do. Another thing, that's, uh, we don't talk about big revolutions because we hate that. The world transformation makes us scared. We just, you know, uh, running the business transformation, it's <laughs> we hate transformation. We heard that word and we just go away. So doing little, uh, changing some of r the routines and seeing that people are not scared away from that, it's the best way for us, not scaring people. Let's do a new routine. For example, some of these uh, things we just, oh, be okay, I'm not going to touch your world, uh, be calm, you can stay calm. Let's just pick up a small project and do it differently. And then if it works, we'll scale for another one. And then we just go and go and go and we don't have to have 80%, but with 20% of change, we can just change the other one. So these are the, these two. For the ones that are, the, the house is, is burning, it's easy. But for the others, we just test a few new projects and uh, try to tease them to think a little bit long term. But it's, it's, diff it's very difficult to, to try it on the first people that they're still learning money because they're still in the learning curve and they're still with their pockets full. So they don't want to hear this, this talk about learning and venture into the unknown in, in the future. Don't know. Thank you for the question. Hi, Paula. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. I'm imagining your presentation from two and a half years ago. And I'm thinking about what have you learned in the last two and a half years in terms yes. of changes? And Great. what are two or three things? Yes. Well, um, one of those days, uh, someone asked me to do a talk in a company uh, about that, precisely that. And um, I, I asked to change the, the subject for what, not what we learned, but what you should have learned. Because today I was coming from Lisbon to the campus and I saw the traffic again and I saw all the things again. I saw all the companies doing the same old things again. That I, I'm a little bit sad because we should have learned more things. One of the things that we should have learned and that some of the clever guys knew it and they're changing their business. I think, you know, today we are mim uh, looking at Aboriginal thinking. I don't know if you knew it. We are, we are trying to see how simple communities of humans that are contemporary to us. We are not less, they're not less sophisticated than us, but how they organize themselves, because we created such a crazy world and such a complex world, we don't understand any, any of the things that are happening. And one of the things that Aboriginal and hunter-gatherers, contemporary tribes these days know, are two big important things that we should have learned these two years, two and a half years. First, we don't know. Because we believe we, know, we knew. We believe we knew it all. And uh, we actually don't. What we knew, what we know, it's a very narrow part of all knowledge that it has to be known. And so this gives us, uh, this puts us in a humble position, humble position, the position of the learner. So I don't know. Admit it, we actually don't. Second, we don't control. And admitting that, a lot of these tribes say, okay, we control a little bit because Mother Nature will control it all. And so these two big things are super important. They, they scare us a lot because not knowing and not controlling might be scary, but it's the learning zone. Let's see it as a positive way. It gives you humility. It gives you this li a little of this Da Vinci wondering what is happening because if I know it all, if I control it all, the game is not very great game to play. And so my point is that I hope that I hope that executives knew that they don't know and they don't control. And that would change the rules of the game. But we are again and sadly coming to that arrogant uh, feature that we control it all. And then if we just mess it, technology will save us. It won't. We know that it won't. And so uh, sadly, we didn't learn so much. But I'm an optimistic, and I hope that some people have learned something and they can do some change around us. And thank you for the question. Oh, we have to stop. I have here a sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. There's no more time for question. And so thank you for your attention, and I hope to speak to you um, soon, uh, to all of you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So next up, we're going to have two announcements, uh, one from Eden, um, community manager at t -Curl, and from Fenil, engineering architect at t -Curl. So we'll have them come up. Hello everyone, um, my name is Eden Hutmacher. I'm the community manager at TQuil. It's such a pleasure to finally see all of you in person again. I have a quick update regarding tomorrow's um, schedule. We would like to use the opportunity now that we're gathered in person to have you all engage in our, some of our active uh, open edX working groups. So we will have four working groups in total uh, present uh, tomorrow, uh, we have the marketing working group, the translations working group, the data working group, and the product working group present. And so between 10 in the morning and 12.30, we would like all of you to join uh, various meetings based on areas that may be of interest to you um, and collaborate and discuss uh, some of our current and future initiatives. Um, all of the detailed information regarding each working group is available in SCED. Uh, the room information is also listed in SCED. Um, the marketing and translations group will meet in the same room because many of the marketing working group members are also members of the translation working group. So we're planning to allocate the two and a half hours between each of these working groups. Um, but you're also free to join multiple working groups. You're free to join uh, several of the rooms and engage in uh, discussions and collaborations. So if you have any questions regarding tomorrow's schedule, feel free to locate me throughout the event today or early tomorrow morning, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have, and I look forward to your participation. Thank you. Yeah, um, you know, I saw this talk recently, I don't know quite where, about engaging with the community more as a way of getting to decide where it goes. So if that's of interest, definitely show up tomorrow. That's when a lot of that will be happening and you can get in touch with all the people that are doing it. Um, speaking of learning though, I did some learning from yesterday. Um, people had a lot of trouble with the birds of a feather. Uh, so we're gonna simplify it a little bit. Uh, the birds of a feather is gonna be in the coffee area where you guys are gonna get coffee this afternoon. Uh, and it's gonna be at the dining tables where you're gonna have lunch um, in a little bit. So after, uh, before the coffee er break, um, we will put the signs for the different birds of a feather topics on different tables. Go to those tables if you wanna talk about those things. Put up new ideas for new things you wanna talk about based on what you saw today or yesterday if you wanna talk about them, and, or just make up a table on the fly. Um, we just wanna, you know, this is a great opportunity to meet and talk to people that you don't get to see day to day, you don't get to see at all often. Um, and you get to engage with them. So take advantage of that time uh, to listen to new ideas and get a bit more diversity of thought. Um, and that's all I have, thank you. All right, and next up we have uh, a video from our reception sponsor, OpenCraft, who's been a major contributor um, to the OpenX platform for many years, since the early, early days. Uh, so we're excited to do that. Um, and we'll go next, unless I have to do anything. Maybe I have to do something. Hi, we're OpenCraft. We provide hosting, support, and customizations for your organization's e-learning platform. Whether you're a major academic institution, an HR department, a small startup, or anyone else offering online instruction. We've been a trusted member of the Open edX open source community since 2013 for clients like edX, Harvard, and MIT. Our community has since grown to include institutions like the University of British Columbia, Arizona State University, and Esme Learning. They count on us to provide technical and strategic e-learning solutions and to produce the best quality code and user experience on the market. The online learning environment is evolving faster than ever. Each day, there are more courses being made available and institutions offering them. As the most recommended provider and one of the largest contributors to OpenEdX, we can ensure you stay ahead of the curve. 
Our team of experts from all around the world take care of the heavy lifting. Whether we're helping you launch different assessment tools or customizing and integrating any software you already use, we deliver our work on time with the high quality and value you need. We can also help you curate content and track learner progress and performance. And that's all while making sure your users enjoy an engaging and user-friendly experience. In other words, our support lets you focus on the things that matter to you most. We know that there's no one-sized-fits-all approach to e-learning. As part of our remote-first approach to work, we have team members on four continents to offer their extensive technical expertise that spans many cultural perspectives, enabling you to reach a broad and diverse user base faster. No matter what your situation calls for, APIs or the integration of LTI tools, a CMS or a CRM, we're there to respond to any SOS. We're founded on the principles of open source and community. We're transparent in every aspect of our company and contribute the majority of the features we develop to the public version of our platform. Whatever you need, we're here to support you every step of the way. So go ahead and say hi to Fox, Gabriel, or any of our team members. Tell us about your project and let us know how we can help. First time I've seen the logo wink at me. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, uh, we're going to have Ed Zarekor, and I'm going to give no other context. I think it's important to note that uh, Gabriel now has a mustache, so uh, he's just there. Yeah, so you don't, you don't want to mess him. Ah, the transition. I had one job. I had one job. All right. As is, t I think this thing is a little jumpy. I got to be honest with you. I'm not the only one. Uh, as is typical at the end of the second day of keynotes, we announce where we will be having the conference next year. Uh, there's already been some rumors circulating, so people may already know the answer, but I wanted to share it officially that next year we will be returning to uh, the Cambridge, Massachusetts area. We'll be hosted by one of the founders of edX and one of the founders of T. Krill. Um, I think you'll probably recognize the institution uh, from this slide. But uh, very thankful that MIT have agreed to host Open edX 2023. And I really hope that we see each and every one of you there next year. So looking forward to it. And thank you all for your contribution to making this a great conference. Uh, let's head over and uh, enjoy lunch and looking forward to the rest of the day and tomorrow with everyone. Thank you.